evening. And now I'd like to introduce our coaches panel. Thank you. Our coaches are father figures. They are big brothers. They are key influencers in the lives of athletes from grade school to high school and beyond. Our focus this evening will be on how these noted and respected coaches have addressed the deaths of black men and women over the past few months with their teams. We want you, the audience, to learn and leave with ideas and examples of how to have difficult discussions with others and ultimately learn to serve as allies for black, indigenous, and people of color, their teammates and classmates, and I dare say friends and family as well. First, I'd like to introduce Coach Thomas Wilcher from Cass Tech High School, uh, Coach Paul Winters from Wayne State University, and Justin Sasante. Can I, do I call you Coach also? Are you a coach? Okay, I just want to make sure. Just Coach Justin Sasante from the National Director. He's the National Director of Football Operations and the Legacy Center. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Um, why don't we start, and I'd like to make this conversational so everybody weigh in as you see the opportunity to do so as we did with our earlier panel. Give me a barometer what the environment um, has been or what it's like with your teams given the social justice issues that we see in the forefront today. I guess since I'm at the end here, I'll start it off. Um, it's very interesting how everything happened this year because on March 9th, we finished the semester basically because COVID. And all of our kids went all over the, the area back to their homes. And I never really got a chance to see them other than Zoom meetings until we brought probably half of them back in July, but really until September. So the conversations were remote and it was even more difficult to, to communicate with them. So, you know, from, from a perspective of sitting down and talking about what was going on, it was happening, but it wasn't happening the way you'd like it to happen, one-on-one um, -on -one or you're in front of the group and, and you're, you're getting a feeling for how they're responding to what you're saying. Um, when, you, when you try to talk on Zoom to 125 guys, it doesn't work because you can't see them all at the same time. You can't get a feel for what's going on. So, so the conversations that I had were email, um, conversations with some of the leaders, it was just kind of dis disjointed a little bit. Okay, we'll share some insight or coaches uh, in terms of you know the topics and, and, and what the interests were. You know, is it what's going to happen to us? I mean, certainly we are. We we got the pandemic uh, along with the protests and those issues. But what were some of the concerns? What were some of the issues? What were some of the questions? I would probably look back and start from the beginning and just say. It was, at first it was a shutdown. It was a shutdown to where there was no communication because we really didn't know how to communicate with the young men or with a lot of friends and family that, who didn't have phones or whatever. So I would have to probably say that it was the shutdown period that really, the isolation that really set the tone because people were scared. When you're in isolation, you start letting the fear become part of you. And once the fear become part of you, because of isolation, you start thinking about the unknown. But once you got in Zoom, once you got a chance to start communicating with people, once you start seeing people face, I mean, I think that start opening up, start saying, hey, we're still here, we're still alive. You start doing checks. Hey, how is your family doing? How is your family doing? How are you doing? How's, how are you coming right now? Are you okay? Do you need anything? You start just trying to start searching for the human side of you, trying to make sure they're okay. And that's the one thing I started doing first with my young men, and that's the one thing I started doing first with my friends and family, trying to make sure that I had an opportunity to reach out to them because I'm okay, I'm doing great, I can prepare myself to come help you right now. And trying to make sure that they knew about all the things that was offered for people because a lot of people didn't know what to do. A lot of people were searching. And so, you know, like we came up here to Boys and Girls Club. We did, we did, a, we did a function up here with the football team and passing our food. But I really remember the first time everybody had an opportunity to meet on Zoom with football players. It was just nothing but just total conversation with the kids. We didn't even meet. They just let them talk. They just let them talk. They talk about an hour. 
That's all we did. Just and what call. did they talk about? That's what I'm saying. Was it just being they concerned? Did. Was it just the connectivity? Or were the issues of the day in terms of social justice part of the discussion? Or I think the, do high school students not care about that no, anymore? I think the most important thing for the high school students were, hey, you are right. Hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. Oh, what you been doing? Oh, they talked about the 2K. <laughs> How good they are now, because they get a chance to sit at home. They talked about all the sports game, the music, and everything. They get a chance to talk about as young men. They get a chance to talk about you know, the camaraderie and everything. Got, got a chance to crack jokes and everything, and just listen to them. And they were just so happy. They was they were just laughing. They were just so good to see each other. And it was just in Zoom. So they were just. I think that's the most important thing was the connectivity they had once they had an opportunity to see each other. That was it. Yeah, I, I've been blessed to be engaged in two different platforms. I, I am I'm engaged with the high school football program, Detroit Catholic Central, but I also um, have developed a club circuit across seven different states, mostly inner cities. And so those are two different things because Catholic Central is predominantly white. Uh, it it's, you know, could be viewed as a, a Republican land or whatever it may be, and, and uh, something that they are taking a very serious stance on is, is diversity which we've been pushing as alumni for a long time. Uh, there's a difference in saying you're going to do it and wanting to do it, and there's a want right now. But we were in the midst of a leadership seminar that I was hosting um, to engage with our football team somehow to develop Coach Wilshire, and I was just talking about that. We lost a lot of opportunity to develop with the kids in person. And we were in the, the middle of, of that. Um, the pandemic was the, the, the problem at first, and then uh, when Greg Floyd was, uh, George, Floyd. George Floyd, excuse me, was, was uh, murdered the way that he was, um, it had to be addressed. And we do have uh, several young black football players on our team, and it was time for us to listen. You know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't interested in hearing everybody's opinion. I was in, interested in hearing where they're at, emotionally, physically, mentally, and what type of perspective will they give us to improve our relationship in our community? And that was powerful. Okay, share. Give us, I, I, this, I, I, I don't I, want you I'll to tell you, the, 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 the young man um, that, that spoke on that, uh, on, on that certain call, because I remember how upset and confused and sad I was, and it was the elephant in the room before we even got there, and we addressed it immediately, and we took a two-hour Zoom uh, to address it. And... He had to start off by first telling the situations he's been in because a lot of the kids in that community, and, and this is what we're talking about, right? You, you, you bridge the gap between people that you want to work together and love and have a respect for each other, and not just on the field, as Sean Wilson said. You know, he had uh, former teammates that he don't talk to and defriended. Uh, how do you bring more substance to that relationship? And him talking about the things that he experienced, even though he lived in a predominant neighborhood, uh, even though that the kids perceived them as being okay because he's in that environment at a prominent school of Catholic Central, uh, really shocked a lot of the kids. And I think that it, it really brought up what he brought up of what he experienced in racism, whether it was from uh, uh, the police officers, whether it was from other students at Catholic Central that, that people weren't even aware of, or just within his experience in sports over the years. And it really shocked the whole team. And it really then created a, uh, and ignited a conversation that had to happen, but it happened holistically and genuinely. And, and then questions started coming back and forth. And so you want to talk about courageous conversations and uncomfortable conversations. I mean, uh, when you're dealing in that environment where you have uh, a minority, a true minority in that setting, and he has to share his emotions and, and, and to the point of tears, uh, it, 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 it was a moment I will never forget as a coach on a Zoom call that, you know, you could hear a pin drop, but you could feel the intensity and the impact of the moment, and it was for the better. So uh, we, we were better for it. Okay, we want to also welcome uh, Coach Corey Parker from River Rouge High School. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I was just asking the coaches, and I'm going to allow you the opportunity to weigh in as well, uh, on the heels of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, two of hundreds of names uh, that are now in the forefront, uh, what's the environment like? I mean, the coaches spoke about the disconnect because of the pandemic, and it has to all be done by Zoom now. But the barometer, the feelings uh, of your team uh, in response to that and the uprising uh, as it relates to the increase in social justice. Uh, well, initially, um, 
uh, chaos, um, uh, anger, uh, frustration, um, and uh, then again, just uh, vulnerability, which is very, very hard to find in teenagers. They had an understanding of a lack of safety because of the color of their skin and how they were identified as young men. And so uh, uh, my task at that point was uh, to try and uh, calm the waters, but the, the, the word try is so large. Um, so it took Zoom meetings with uh, uh, Coach Wilcher um, and our group, we were talking at the time, we were just really just trying to get college coaches just to speak directly to us as coaches and get some advice on things and become better coaches. And it really turned out that we started using some of those moments as uh, times that we can feed into each other and figure out how we're gonna help our young men. And then the same thing ended up happening with Coach Sasanti created a dialogue for all of us to meet and have conversations. So it wasn't anything that we could all figure out on our own. It really took a collective uh, of things to happen. Uh, obviously, we ended up marching uh, downtown Detroit um, as a collective, as a group, just to show some solidarity, to show our young men, no, we don't have all the answers, but this is what we're going to do together right now. And so uh, a lot of the, the answers and the word try is still out there. It, there's, there hasn't been any definites right now, um, and I don't think there could be any definites with the fact that this has been going on for so long. As I said prior, um, you know, uh, this is something that my grandfather has dealt with, my, uh, my father has dealt with, and now myself. My job is now uh, as a husband and a father of a, a young brown boy is to do everything that I can to make sure it doesn't uh, happen again, it doesn't happen to him, and doesn't happen to other young men that even uh, look or resemble anything like him, whether they're uh, black, brown, Caucasian, no matter what they are. So uh, uh, my task is very, very large, just as all the men and all the women inside this room. So uh, uh, I, I commend everybody for continuously trying, but it's gonna be continuous, I believe. So how do you, and this is for everybody, again, conversational, so just feel free to weigh in. Uh, begin to tackle that task using your role as a coach and sports as a vehicle. I would like to say that um, we, set, we stopped practice one day and uh, we set everybody down in the circle and we moved out, spaced out. And we started talking about, my topic was making it back home, getting back home. And they didn't really understood what I meant by making it back home because they felt that if you go outside, you go to the store, you automatically, if you walk to the store, you come back, you're going to automatically come back home. But I had to tell them that, you know, in, in today's society, you're not going to just walk out the door, get in your car, now you're 16 years old, 17 years old. You can't just drive to the store and say, I'm coming back home. You got you to have an exit plan and how to make it back home. But they didn't understand it because they feel that I did nothing wrong. Why should I be victimized? I said, it's not because of who you are. It's because of what perception that they have of you. I said, so therefore, I, wanted, I want everyone here to figure out how to make it back home. I said, how do you make it back home? Number one is, you have to be respectful. As you, as you are respectful to me, you have to be respectful to your parents, you have to be respectful to everybody you meet. And they said, I am respectful. I said, but yes, but you still have to keep being respectful because you have to make it back home. And so making it back home was just the topic of our discussion. And once I started talking about making it back home, they didn't realize that I was meaning that you could get killed, you could get shot. And I said, by anybody, it could be the police, it could be the guy at the drugstore, it could be the guy at the gas station, anybody. You gotta have a, a way how to make it back home. And, but we focused around police, but I was trying to mean that every time you go outside, every time you go someplace, you gotta figure out how to make it back home. And that was one way how I tried to hit the topic without singling out police officers, because all police officers are not bad. They're not. There's just some few people, it's a few of us that feel that way, that they are bad, but it's just a few police officers that are bad, that brings down the whole system. And so I didn't want to focus upon police officers, I just wanted to focus on them, making sure they had an exit plan on how to leave the situation and make it back home. If you are stopped by the police, how do you address the police? What do you say? Even if they are wrong, you have a right to go back to the police station. I said, don't fight your battles right there. Fight your battles in the court. Fight your battles with your parents. Taking you down, back down to the police station. Write something up. If you get enough referrals on a police officer, 
they was, they was trying to have a conversation about that person. So I just wanted to make sure they understood that you have to always make it back home. It's not a given that you automatically get stopped and you can leave that, that situation because you have to make it back home. That's what we talked about. Well, we have a different group, obviously, because we recruit from all over the state. We recruit from different states, and we have a very diverse football team. So what we've tried to do and what I've tried to do with these guys is create an atmosphere where we actually get to know someone who looks different than us and find out what's, the, what's similar, what's different, what, you know, why are we in this same room together. So we, we do this every year. We have camp buddies. And, and basically what I'll do is if I have a, 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 a white football player from a, a farm area, I'm going to put him with a, a young man from Detroit or, you know, a white suburban kid, it's kind of the same thing. And so what happens is they, they are charged to eat together. They're charged to talk about what they enjoy doing, what they don't like doing, you know, just kind of. Kind of like on the blind side. When you yeah. Them. Okay. And, and, but we do this with a hundred and some odd people. And then what we do is we have them as part of our, our football camp in the beginning of, of this, every season. You've got to come up and talk to the team about your camp buddy. And you talk about building a family. You talk about building a group. And really, you know, you, you talk about you're all in the same thing, trying to win, but really caring about each other. I have guys that come back and talk to me 10 years later about their camp buddy was their best man or their camp buddy was the godfather of their kids, you know, or sometimes it's just a position player. But, but what happens is you break down all these barriers that we're talking about. Um, there's a lot of things that they find out that they have in common that growing up, you talk about educating them, growing up they never knew what they had in common because they never had a conversation with a black man from Detroit or a white man from Columbus, Ohio, whatever it is. It's just a situation where ideally we talk about when there's a lack of communication, that void is filled with negativity. So we want to try to communicate and we want to try to make sure that we understand that there are differences, but there are so much, so many more solemn, uh, I'm sorry, similarities. <laughs> similarities. We know it. Exactly. <laughs> hey, when you get a football coach and we're in the season or not in the season, we forget how to talk sometimes. Oh, that's all right. We understand. I would say, uh, Educate and, and strategize are the two things that we just we figured that these are the two things that we want to do. And what I mean by that is uh, we want to make sure education wise um, our guys are putting themselves in position to continuously uh, break perceptions by going and get a great education. Uh, the more of us uh, men of color with a great education, the more opportunities we have to break the perception of how we are identified. So that was number one. And so I talked to my guys about that. I don't care what school you go to, whether it's an NAI school, Division II school, Division III school, Division I school, you got to go to school, you know. And so I pushed that narrative. The next piece um, that, that, that we really just discussed and we thought about, we put a lot of work into it, but it took a collective from our community in River Rouge to also support it. Um, we strategized. And what I mean by that strategizing is the, our guys take repetitions at getting pulled over. What is it going to feel like? I literally put them inside of my car, and I have one of our Rouge police officers pull them over, obviously in a safer environment, in an environment where they're, they're in a parking lot of our school, but they have to go through the repetition of what the expectations are from the time someone approaches them. From the time you, someone approaches you, what do I say? How do I speak? What type of eye contact do I give? Are all of these things going to give us opportunity to stay alive? No, but it's just a chance. 
And that's all I could ask for is to have a chance. So we, we talked about that strat the, the, the strategy behind also, if you, you're pulled over by police, you feel unsafe, call the police. Call 911. That may give you a shot. It, you're, now you're talking to someone that is, is hearing everything that's being said. Now it's being recorded. We never know what is going to help. But I'm trying everything I can to keep uh, myself uh, from attending a funeral of one of my players for something that every, everybody's seeing now um, at, on, on, on their telephones on a regular basis. So those are the two things that we did, and it's different. But right now, uh, you know, trying something different, I'm willing to do if that's going to keep one of my guys alive. Coach Sam. Yeah, I, I'm, I think I, I relate a lot to Coach Winters because in the club platform, you have a lot of kids from different races, ethnic, ethnicities, and religions coming together for a shorter period of time. So they, they don't have the substance that you have on a high school football team, which makes high school and college football and, and the team concept so great. Um, you know, what we have said, we have to know where we came from in order to know where we're at and where we're going. And that, that really struck with me when Sean was talking about education in that people that are racist are ignorant. They, they learn it. They learn it somewhere. You're not born that way. Um, I think the, 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 the uncomfortableness that you're going to bring to a setting like that where you have a lot of people that aren't even real familiar with each other, but you have to address racism, you have to address systematic problems, um, you have to also understand that people are going to stand up and not know what they don't know, and they could say something very offensive or very ignorant. So how do you address that? How do you prepare uh, the kids in our program that are from minority that say you may have to, you don't have to tolerate it. What we're trying to accomplish here is the change of mind. I don't believe you can change a rotten heart, but you can change a rotten mind. And so how are we going to do this? So it's a prepping of the, the targeted group that is feeling, uh, and, and for the right reason, feeling attacked in this country and saying, in order for us, our future to look brighter and to engage the other side, this is what we're going to have to go through hand in hand. And we're still working out those kinks, but it, you, you have to engage. I, I want to ask you a question because you grew up on Telegraph and Joy Road. So you've got a unique background and perspective. How do you use that exposure, that experience, and that background to help create the environment where people are garnering a better understanding of those who look and live differently. Yeah, I, I grew up in a melting pot. I mean, literally a black community on one side, Arab community on the other. Um, and I saw things at a young age. The first time I saw uh, uh, police harassment uh, was when I was 12 years old with two of my black friends. They made them get down, guns drawn, in a puddle after we played basketball that we were carrying a gun around the neighborhood. Uh, I was beat up by the police out of college. Um, and the first thing that I thought after I got put in the hospital by the police is if I was black and if I was poor, on top of that, I would have no resource to fight this. And I wasn't. I was a white male coaching at Catholic Central at the time with a, with a college education, and they did the same thing to me. The difference was I could have fought. I, I, I had the ability to fight my way out of it. How many young men, young women have not? And... That has really given me a perspective. I'm never going to say that I can walk in the shoes a day uh, of, of, of a black man or a black man with a black son to understand the fear that they have, that I'm not going to have to feel for my daughters. But I definitely have gotten enough a taste of it to know that we have to fight together and to change. And uh, that's the perspective it's gave me. And I, I don't think I'm more proud of anything in my life than where I grew up and who I grew up with. It's been an interesting perspective in life, and it's been valuable. Well, it is about exposure. Uh, I think that makes all the difference in the world that when people grow up in segregated areas, and as our earlier panel pointed out, uh, Southeast Michigan, Michigan in itself, is probably one of the most segregated areas in the country. But let me ask the other three coaches, your experience as black men, I mean, how do you use that as a teaching tool, your experience, your exposure, to help strengthen your, your team? Well, I'm going to say this right here. I, my experience is uh, I've had, I had one experience. It was really crazy, though. But it was one of my, uh, I was driving down the street in my car in my neighborhood. And so police officer pulled me over. He pulled me over, pulled his gun out, drawn, creeped up to my car. 
And I looked and saw who the police are. It was one of my parents, <laughs> of my football player. And so I'm looking. I'm just sitting here like, God, what, what do I do? I wonder why he stopped me. So he didn't know who I was. I was in a different car. And I comes up to the window, taps on it. I let my window down. He said, we looked at each other. I said, why did you stop me? He said, well, I thought because you had this car and I stopped you because of the area we were in and you driving this type of car. And I didn't know because a lot of drug stuff going around here. And that's why we stopped you. So it was just profiling. And I said, that's, that's wrong. He said, yeah, but that's what we do sometimes. I mean, this was one of my parents, one of my football players. So did he ever realize that who you were? <laughs> I mean, yeah, he knew who I was. I mean, I coached his son. But he didn't care? I mean, he, he didn't know who I was because I had a different car. I, I was in a different car. But I would probably have to say something that's a little bit more important than that is I was in this club called Coach's Care. And so what, after the Floyd incident, they really wanted to get together and try to start a forum. And they kept asking me how to start a form. At first, I was really kind of shy in what to say. And then I just said, look, if you, now coaches care, that is all police officers mm -hmm. who wants to go out there and they retire or whatever, and they come into your community, help out people and everything like that. And so they said that um, they want to help out coaches. And I said, first of all, if you really want to help out people, you got to really first be honest. And so I really didn't tell them what I meant. I just said, just be honest. And so they kept asking me. I said, okay, if you want to be honest with people, tell them that you have wrong police officers. Tell them why you stop people. Tell them that you do kill people. Tell them that I don't care about if the kid stops in the car. I don't care if the kid have his hands on the windshield. I don't care if the kid have his hands on the dog on steering wheel. You're still going to get shot because I had a bad day today. And you just looked at me wrong. And I didn't care. I wanted to kill somebody. I can get away with it. You need to be honest and say that there are police officers like that. Stop saying that, oh, we thought the kid twitched. We thought this happened. Why don't you be honest and say some people are out here are just vigilantes? Because if you don't say it, kids going to say, I don't believe you because I do say, yes, sir, officer. I do put my hands on the steering wheel. I do say I'm reaching for my wallet. I do say, can I get my, can I get my, can I get my ID out? Can I get my insurance card out? Can I get all these things out and show it to you? But I still get shot. No matter if you're a passenger or whether you're a driver, you still get shot. And so I just told those guys, I said, look, and tell you honest about that, then you can tell a kid how to be pulled over. But a kid will only look at you and say, what you're telling me is not true because we see it every day. So how could you tell me that if I put my hands on the steering wheel, look straight ahead and say, yes, sir, officer, I won't get shot. So I have to tell them, I said, you have to be honest, tell them, why police officers feel this way, why police officers attack young teens, why, te why police officers attack black males from your experience as being a police officer. I mean, it's time for you guys to speak out against who you're trying to represent because the same police officer I stopped when I was a kid to go yell help is not the same guy I'm stopping right now to go say help. I'm stopping right now. I'm stopping somebody on the street before I stop them sometime because I don't want to call 911. I'm going to call my friends sometimes. So I just think that until we have the honest conversation, until we put the cards on the table and really tell the kids what's going on, what's happening, there's not going to be a change. We need to open up the dialogue. We need to talk about the police officers. We need to talk about the wrongdoing in, in different type of cities, what's going on. Because if we don't, they're going to keep being the same. And these young men right now, they're a little bit more, they want to protest. They want to be out there. They want to be in the streets. They want to go out there and march up and down. And every day that I practice, Black Lives Matter march right up and down the street, coming down ML King. And we stop every day in practice and look at them and we clap. So I'm just saying that our voice want to be heard. And we want to be honest. We want to have dialogue about the truth so then we can understand really what's going on. Because it's not about put your hands on the steering wheel. It's not about that. Right. Compliance doesn't necessarily work. Coach Winters? Well, we, we talk about it's okay to be afraid that I grew up in the time when Martin Luther King was marching and they were burning our city and I was afraid and really what I knew the team needed and what we talked about was hope hope for change hope for, for to make a difference um, Somebody mentioned in the previous um, talk about 
we're building leaders. Mm -hmm. And that was the hope that we provide for our players. You know, our guys, are, they're, most of them are going to be college graduates. They're going to have to work really hard not to be, okay? Um, I drew an example of two of our guys that were linebackers, one black from Toledo, one white from De La Salle. Um, just totally different backgrounds. And how if you approached one of them, the other one would fight you because they had become brothers. And that one young man from De La Salle was an example, a criminal justice major. And he's going to be one of those guys, probably higher up, but you know, stopping people. And we have hope that because of the relationship that this man had with this black man, he's not going to look at somebody by color. He's going to look at what they did. And we as leaders can, can continue to develop that and can, can continue to make a difference in the world because of our leadership and because of the fact that we know that blacks and whites are the same and can get along and can be family members. So our hope is for us to make a difference, us to make the change. Coach Parker. Um, so I, I speak to my players a lot from the player's perspective. And so I had a couple of experiences as a high school student athlete at St. Martin de Porres that always stay with me and how we are identified by fans, student sections, and things of that nature. And so our, our school at St. Martin de Porres was a, a, a you know, it's a, it was a, a small school, but it was a, a great school, but we were 100% African-American school. Um, and so very similar to the environment that I coach in now, we're not 100% African-American at River Rouge, but my team is at this particular point. So I always speak to these particular instances where, um, you know, the way that fans, officials, um, parents treat us of the opponent, I tell them it, 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 all, it all comes back full circle with how you are identified and treated by police officers that have negative outlooks on you. And so I say these people are all the same. They, they, they have the same type mentality. So what I, what I tell them is um, you cannot allow uh, the way that uh, these experiences um, happen, you cannot allow that to corrode your mindset and have you treat people uh, in a negative manner. Uh, the two experiences that I had was um, we're playing a particular school in, um, in basketball. Um, and uh, uh, we end up beating the team, and they, they, they yell to chant, that's all right, that's okay, we're going to be your boss someday. And so back then, you just thought, okay, it's just a chant. But now, it, that sits still inside of my head. No, no, that wasn't all right to say that wasn't appropriate. We made another run into a state playoff, very, very deep into the state playoffs, right before we go into the Breslin Center. Um, the, fan, the student section threw, threw bags, opened up bags of cotton, cotton balls and threw them out on the court. And um, it was inappropriate. No one did anything about it. We just tolerated it. Our coaches told us, blow them out, make them pay for it. That's the way we handled stuff like that back then. Just brush it under the rug and you didn't really pay attention to how it affects you mentally later on, so on and so forth. And, and, and so the toughest thing about that now is we see now that stuff that will be captured on the internet. It'll be captured on YouTube. It'll be captured on Facebook, social media. Well, back then, no one would ever know unless you said something about it. So now I tell my guys all the time, I didn't allow that to corrode my mindset. I now work with people um, that are Caucasian. I've had teammates at the college level that were Caucasian. I didn't let what happened to me in that particular experience affect the way I feel about others. So don't allow it to affect you either. Do the best you can to build great relationships with people, no matter their gender, uh, sexual orientation, their nationality, or their ethnicity. And so it's, it's a difficult conversation to have right now because all they continuously see is someone of a different color harming us on film. And they also see people that look just like them, which creates a level of self-hate at times, killing each other that makes them feel bad about themselves as well. So it's a tough conversation, but it's willing to have.
So we're wrapping up, uh, running out of time. We only got another eight minutes or so. I'd like to ask, how do we level the playing field using sports? Certainly through player development, certainly through your coaching and, and counseling and mentoring to those young men. Your visibility and your voices in the community all matter. But going forward, what can the community, people who are watching, who are listening, who come to the games, who may be parents of athletes, I mean, I know that's a lot, but I'm just looking for a thumbnail that people can put in their pocket and take with them as they leave today to try to figure out how to make a difference. I'm going to start and we're going to work down that way if that's okay. Our responsibility as coaches and organizations is to do more and to bring this to the forefront. Um, the, one of the terms that I couldn't stand that I kept hearing after uh, George Floyd passed away, well, the dust will settle. Well, we can't let this dust settle. You know, we can't as a community, we can't as a human race. It's really hard when you have leadership that you can't use it as a proper example for our youth and that there's this uh, division being created. But our responsibility within our communities is control what we can control. And what are we bringing to the forefront? We are so... Uh, interested in obviously playing the sport, competing and winning, and getting kids to college, but can we keep them there? Education, can we keep them educated? Can we get them through from uh, what Coach Winters does a fantastic job at Wayne State doing, getting them degrees and getting them opportunities for careers, and also at the same time creating that diverse environment that they can grow and cultivate? And uh, I think that that's where we have to go. As much as we have really attacked recruiting and competition, we have to attack education and education in the form of, of bringing up racism and social injustice and educating where this country's been, where we are today, and where do we want to go as a group? Where is that big vision that Sean Wilson talked about? Well, for me, the one thing that I'm trying to always hit, a, hit home with is trying to develop my young men to become men trying to develop my young men so they can become great sons, great fathers, so they can one day become a good uncle. But everything I talk about, we talk about it with enthusiasm that we want them to understand that we love them. Because it's hard to get young men to understand that it's okay to love. It's okay to nurture. It's okay to share your feelings with one another. Because a lot of times men don't say the word love unless we try to express it to another woman. We don't really express it to each other. We may say, hey, yes, that's my bro, that's my man. But sometimes we gotta let people know that we love them. And that's one word we throw around in practice and we use every day in practice the word love. Hey, I love what you're doing. I love you, man. I love everything about you. It's not about you saying that I'm gonna do everything I can for my player. I'm gonna do everything I can for that person. Every coach said, I'm gonna do what I can for that player. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do everything I can for that person because I want them to know that I love you, I love what you do, I love that you come to practice every day and try hard. And when we get together, I tell them, I say, I love you. Our coaches tell our kids we love them and because we want them to know that it's a personal thing between us. We hear every day. I have, I have a lot of great coaches, a lot of great coaches. They own their own business, they're executives. The presidents and all that, they own companies, lawyers, everything. And they come there every day with great enthusiasm. And I let those young men know, they come here because of you. They come here every day, they race down the freeway to get here because of you. Because they want to show how much they care about you, they want to show how much they, they think of you. And so we want to let them know all the time that we love them. And as we go on through practice, you shake their hand, you pat them on the back, you scream at them, you yell at them, you say, this is family. We're there for you. And we always make sure they know that they got to be able to share their films with us because we're there for them. I still talk to my players in college. I still talk to the players in the NFL. They come back. We work out together. We get together. We break bread together. This, over, the, over the course of summer, we got together. So it's about, it's about family. It's about trying to create a tradition, trying to also trying to show them how to build a family so they can understand that men – don't just become men by just learning through experience. You got to also be able to share your experience because you have to be able to be the type of person that can hug your son as, like, as you hug your daughter. You got to be the type of man who can walk down the street with your arm around your son 
like you walk down the street and hold your door to hand. And that's how we want our kids to feel. Because if we can't teach them how to love, we also are not going to be able to teach them how to love one another and love the people walking up and down the street with. So that's one thing I always try to do and practice as I'm growing older as a man is try to let these young men know you have to let people know that you love them. And I have to always express to them that I do love them. That's it. That's powerful. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> um, we all, as coaches, have an impact on our players. But because of our position, sometimes we have a bigger impact in the community. And, and I've had conversations with police chiefs. I'm fortunate enough to be able to do that. And I think our role as coaches, sometimes when we have those conversations with community leaders after successful seasons, after you guys you know, have great seasons, it's, it's up to us to question some of those community leaders when we've got them in that one-on-one -on -one situation. And I've had a conversation with a, a police chief from a, a prim primarily white community asking him, do you have officers that you know are racist and what are you doing about it? And I got an answer of, yeah, we've got to let them kind of move on as their career ends and replace them with better people. And, and I think it's maybe our job sometimes to educate them that, no, you don't have to wait until they move on. It's, you've got to do something. And, and I think, unfortunately for us, some of the problems that we have is that no one wants to offend anybody. No one wants to, to make that hard decision to let somebody go because they're the wrong person for the job. So, you know, we're not necessarily, as football coaches, going to change the idea of, you know, uh, a police chief. But I also know that I have seven former players that work for the um, Wayne State Police Department. And I know they're the right kind of people. So like everyone has said, we're have to, we have to continue to build leaders and um, just build the right kind of character in our, our players. They're also working for the right leader with Chief yes, Holt. That's another thing. That. He's not going to tolerate exactly any foolishness. Right. <laughs> Coach Parker. Uh, I, I believe um, racism and, and prejudiced behaviors um, comes from a root cause. And I think uh, Justin, uh, uh, you know, elaborated on that a little bit earlier. And I think uh, if we as, as as coaches who have relationships with other coaches around the state of Michigan. And maybe that's just the start. A lot of uh, my coaching friends that coach on the west side of the state that I might have played college ball with or just have a relationship with, um, once everything occurred, a lot of guys reached out, hey, are you okay? How are everything going for you? And it's okay for us to tell them, no, I'm not okay. No, everything's not going to be all right. What can I do to help is usually the next question. So my task, uh, you know, after uh, Mr. Floyd passed away um, was to then let some of my friends know that coaching cities and states that are uh, uh, majority Caucasian, try to assist your program um, or your community with some type of addition to diversity there. You know, whatever that looks like, I don't know what that is. And, and, and it, it could assist with having everybody then have a clear under, a better understanding of who we really are and that we bleed just like you do if we're cut. We, we are, we're hurt uh, just like you do, so on and so forth. And if it starts when they're just young babies, things could change for later days. But if, if all I see is what I know in my community and the first experience that I have with somebody that is African American is a negative experience, that's where my prejudice behavior may come from. It could come from that. Or it could come from uh, uh, my first time around somebody that's African American is inside of a, a college setting. So I went all through grade school, 
all through high school, I've never been around an African-American person before. So now I have my own perception of who you are, maybe by what I see on, in the media, maybe by what I see on TV, maybe by what I see in the movies. We can't change that part, but what we can change is how many opportunities they, that, 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 that students, that players, that little kids have to be around us when we are at our most positive moments. So that's what I told all the coaches I know. Hey, if you get an opportunity, do some diversity training. Well, what does that look like? Bring them down to a River Rouge football game. I'll give them all free passes. Let them, let, we'll show them how we do things, and they'll see, hey, your game's not no different than our games. So on and so on and so on. Whatever it takes. But as I stated, got to try something different at this point. And the only thing that I, I know is just continuously brainstorming and talking with others. That's the one takeaway that I have is just continuously trying to figure different ways to make it better at the root cause, the, the youngest people available so they can grow and have a better understanding that the color doesn't make us any difference. It's really what's inside of our hearts. You're absolutely right. And I think it, it's almost so simple that it's complex. And sometimes it's as simple as looking at a person who doesn't look like you in the eye and speaking. I mean, it breaks a barrier. Uh, and, and I think that attitude and performance are a reflection of leadership. I want to thank you, gentlemen, as coaches, for your leadership, for who you are and what you do. Uh, it's not an easy conversation, and it's not an easy task to address, but I certainly applaud Zenith, uh, the Boys and Girls Club, Sean, you know, you guys, everything that you're doing to have this conversation, and I hope that the conversations continue, and I hope the efforts continue uh, on our parts individually and collectively. Let's give our coaches a round of applause and a virtual round of applause, and I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone at home who's watching. Uh, you know, as we stated earlier at the beginning of the program, uh, what an evening, by the way. Uh, a lot of great conversation, courageous, conversa courageous conversations. Excuse me, Coach Winters, I know it's hard to keep talking, right? Um, courageous conversations, certainly one of the big themes uh, that came out of, out of the program tonight. And so thank you all for joining us. One of the goals that we had uh, for the program this, this evening was for the impact to carry on to be sustainable, to have uh, more of an impact than just that we can make in these two hours. So a couple of the two things that we're going to be doing. One, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the recording online, as well as providing a toolkit for your own courageous conversation with your family, with your community, with your team, based on the themes that were discussed tonight. And something that we're really proud to announce right now at this moment, uh, in partnership with our friends at the Sports Commission, there will be a scholarship for a student athlete uh, that's graduating this year. There will be an essay contest uh, based on the themes of this evening. This will be coming live in November. So we'll be publicizing this uh, as that date draws closer, but it will be a, a scholarship opportunity for a student athlete uh, between Zenith and the Sports Commission in a partnership there. So on that note, I wanna end this evening. Thank you all again for your time and thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you. <laughs>